we can officially see you uh, in the live stream. It says we're live on here. Okay. Oh, we're good. Okay. I'm going to be quiet now. There we go. Hello. Do you want to introduce Hello. yourself first? You can go first. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Shakira Quinones and I'm a PhD student at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. But we are here, uh, here at our lab uh, that is not connected to the university. This is actually part of the um, Biology Institute at the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts. And uh, we have a lab that is more of a collaboration between many scientists. And we call it the Easy Lab. And it was founded by Dr. Matthias Kundner. And then we also have Dr. Simona Kral Fischer. We have Dr. Matthias Gregoric, uh, recent Dr. Clement Chandek. Then we have four PhD students and one molecular biologist and lab technician. And uh, yeah, do you want to introduce yourself now? Sure. Uh, my name is Dallas Hasselhan. I have my bachelor's degree in biology, and I did all my undergrad research on tarantulas. Uh, I'm at Eastern Michigan University in the Shillington Arachnids lab. I have, there are a few master students as well as quite a few undergrads. Likewise, I not only do I work with tarantulas, I also work at a um, biocontrol company selling bumblebees to farmers in greenhouses, so I do a bunch of bumblebee health as well. Uh, and in fact, two weeks, I am moving out to Colorado to work with the uh, US, US Fish and Wildlife Services at White River National Forest as a backcountry conservation uh, technician. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, but I think we're here now just to talk about the spiders. Do you want to show off your lab? And yeah, sure. Um... Around your lab? Yeah, um, I actually brought some samples here, but I can also walk you around. Okay. And uh, just to let the other people know, that we, when we were talking before going live, uh, we were both saying that we're not uh, arachnologists by training. So, um, but we, we've been working with spiders for our PhDs. Mm -hmm. So, and mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> we will show you. Yeah. So uh, in this lab, we actually mostly have web spiders. Uh, we have uh, the Mediterranean black widow that is called Atrodectus tredecimugatus, which means uh, 13, uh, 13 spots. So you can identify them by 13 like um, red or orange spots. So I can show you that lady right now. Um, she was actually trying to escape to... before <laughs> because I kept her open. And um, so... That's her. Do you see her? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so she has an egg sac there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So these are one of our spiders. And then um, another spider that we have here that is an orb spider is the one I work with uh, for my PhD. It's called um, Nephilingis cruentata. And these spiders are really cool because they have a uh, sexual size dimorphism. So I will show you the female. That's the female. I don't, I don't know if you can see her. Yep. Okay. And then the male is right there too, but he's tiny. It, it's just oh really hard to see, but this is the male yeah. and I'll make him walk. Yeah. I hope you saw that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then, um, we have another spider that is, she's just a lab pet, but mm -hmm. this is a Triconephila fenestrata from South Africa. Um, can you see her? Uh-huh, wow. Yeah, so she's quite big, see? Uh -huh. And she's actually a, a small specimen in comparison. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think she's an adult yet, so she could mm -hmm. grow a little, bit, uh, a little bit more. I'm slightly then, jealous of your species. I was uh, collecting some orb weavers near my house and I brought them all back to my garden and put them all over the place just because I love them so much. So getting to see them in your lab is awesome. Yeah, they're really, 
really uh, fascinating and um, they're quite big and people are afraid of them. I was actually afraid of them too in the beginning, mm -hmm. but they're very gentle and they don't really know how to walk outside of their <laughs> web. So <laughs> it's not, uh, I guess people are afraid that spiders are going to jump on them, but if a spider lives on a web, it's, you have to really disturb them for them to go out of their webs. Mm -hmm. And they're just so pretty. <laughs> Yeah. And then um, we have another species that is um, like a, it's called a raft spider or um, fishing spider. So it, this one does not live on a web. It uh, usually lives um, near water. And we have one here. Let me just uh, put the phone back. So it's easier for me to show you. Oh. And that's her. Wow. Yeah. And you said it was a fishing spider or a uh, yes. rest spider? Okay. Yeah, so this is local. This is a local species. We find it here in Slovenia. Mm -hmm. And um, the Mediterranean black widow, we can find it in Croatia. And then the other two spiders that I was showing um, we are from South Africa. Okay. Um, so I have the uh, questions open, and there was a couple of questions while you're giving your tour. Um, would you mm -hmm. like me? I can read some of them to you. And... Yeah, sure. Okay. So let's see. Uh, uh, Elma asked, "Why do the males tend to be smaller than the females?" We don't know yet. <laughs> So that's uh, part of the research. There's a large body of research um, about um, sexual size dimorphism. Mm -hmm. And uh, my PhD um, focuses on that. And there's many hypotheses. And um, one of them is that um, females are larger because of fecundity selection pressure. So the, um, the larger the females, the more fecund they are. But that doesn't explain why males have not um, like grown as, as big as females and why they're so tiny. So these cases are very, very extreme. And there's uh, many reasons, uh, well, many um, hypotheses, mm -hmm. and uh, none of them are conclusive. Uh, there's um, um, maybe males, because males mature earlier than females, then they can... Um, they can reach a female uh, faster than other males. So they have advantage in like what is called scramble competition. So the earlier you mature, the faster you can reach a female and then you have a mating opportunity and you don't have to fight other males. And um, there's other hypotheses. Uh, one is gra the gravity hypothesis, which means then um, that males cannot grow as bigger because males have to abandon their webs when they become adult and uh, look for females. And if they're too big, then maybe they cannot climb so well and you know they, they will have some physical constraints and it would be better to stay small. But yeah, we, we don't really know. Like there's many other hypotheses or maybe the females cannibalize the larger males more mm -hmm. and then the other males just sneak in for, um, for copulation. And yeah, there's many, but we, we don't have a universal one. Cool. That's interesting, though. That makes it more fun for us, right? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this is just a fun question because I'm also interested. Uh, has a spider ever escaped? And what is the lab protocol for one that gets out? Do you want to answer that? Because I actually have an escape behind me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so in, in my lab, uh, uh, and I'll show you guys around in a little bit with my lab, but we have uh, tarantulas and sometimes they just move quicker than you think. Uh, we've had them, we've learned to not wear long sleeve shirts because they'll run up the sleeve of your shirt. And then it's a pain to try and get your shirt off while also not hurting the spider. Um, and then sometimes we have, when I, I'll show you around, but we have tape over pretty much every corner of the lab because there's little cracks in the walls and they always find the little cracks and get into the cabinet somehow if they get out um, but we don't lose that many 
I'm making it sound like we lose a lot, but there's only a few that get out every once in a while. But how about you? Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Sometimes it happens. And in our case, because they live in webs, they just make a web in the lab. And sometimes we just leave them and just have them as pets. <laughs> we just mm -hmm. feed them. Um, all right. So do you have anything else that you want to share before I'll, I can show my lab and then we can get back to more questions and things like that? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Uh, so let's see. So like I mentioned, I work with tarantulas um, and we have many different types. We're actually in the process of uh, trading some to a tarantula breeder um, who we've worked with for many years and uh, we can rely on um, and we're trading some. So our lab's a little messy right now as we're you know, shipping them out. Um, but, you know, every lab gets a little messy. So yeah. I think the first thing I'll show is the uh, size difference between the different ages. Um, so we have the main species we work with or have a lot of are Granistola pulchropes, which are the golden knees. So you can see right there, it's just about the size of my finger. Um, it's just a little, a little lady. Um, but then after a couple of months of feeding, they'll get much bigger. So this is, uh, we name a lot of our spiders. So this is Ian. Um, <laughs> and she's about the size of my palm, uh, a little bit, you know, the size of my pinky finger. Um, mm -hmm. And then towards the end of their life, just like with your spiders, they have uh, sexual dimorphism. So the females get much bigger. Ooh. A little, a little jumpy, but this is, I believe her name is Farah, um, and she's about a sub adult. She'll get a little bit bigger as an adult, mm -hmm. um, but she's, you can see, okay, she's a little bit smaller than my palm. Um, and that she's the biggest one of the golden knees that we have. And then let's see, we have close to, um, 300 tarantulas in all these cabinets around our lab. Um, so we have plenty of, uh, these are all the golden knees. You can see this one's saying hi. Um, these are orange baboon tarantulas. Um, they get their nickname, or they get their name because they're bright orange. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but let's see if I can get this. Can you oh, yeah. see the color at all? There we go. You can kind of see it. I'm being careful because um, none of our tarantulas have venom that will kill us or hurt us that badly. But these orange baboon tarantulas in the pet trade, their nickname is OBT. Um, and that usually gets abbreviated from their other nickname, which is orange bitey thing, because they are pretty aggressive for what they are. Um, but they're beautiful and I've worked with them. I've had to get them in um, so you can see, for one of my projects, I had to get them into this two inch by two inch cube, um, which was took a couple of hours because I was kind of I'm kind of scared of them a little bit. They're not because they can hurt me or anything, but just because they're quick and I don't want them running up the back of my shirt, and then I could potentially hurt them. Um, let's see what else we have. Some other classic tarantulas. Um, that you can find at a lot of pet stores and things like that. Uh, this is a Chilean rose hair, um, and she's a little scared right now, so she's trying to make herself as small as possible. Um, <laughs> she's I think, cute. yeah. Oh, here we go. Here's another golden knee. Uh, this one's name is Taurus, uh, and he's got a really big house because I think we're moving him into a i think one of us is taking him home so we just put him in a temporary enclosure and then this is another chilean rose hair they have they're just kind of this dark umber and they're really beautiful but they do get scared whenever i open their containers because they're not used to it um all of our spiders no matter how big they get are always just little scaredy cats mm -hmm. uh, these are curly hair tarantulas so we have a student working with these so there's probably about 30 of them. Um, and then some of the more interesting, unique tarantulas we have are 
Uh, these are the horned bamboo tarantulas. They're very tiny right now. Uh, they actually just, one second, let me put you down so I can open up the lid. Sorry. They just recently hatched out of their egg sac, so they're all mm -hmm. pretty tiny, um, but they're cute nonetheless. Here, one second. Make mm -hmm. sure it doesn't run out. Here we go. So you can see it's like the tip of my finger, and it's just a little oh, tiny yeah. baby. Uh, so these, when they get um, old enough, will develop a horn on the top of their head. Uh, it's kind of up in the air what it's for, but uh, we have one of our students who's using an electron microscope to see how much it is involved in muscle attachment and various other things. These are a dwarf species of tarantula. Um, so you can see right here. They're about the size of my fingernail, um, and they're about one or two months away from being fully grown. So they're really tiny, but they're very cute. Um, and let's see. But those and are then, female or male? Um, they are, I, I think they're still too young to uh, properly sex, um, okay. but we might be able to get there. But they, they mm -hmm. are a, yeah, they're a dwarf species, so they stay relatively small. Um, and they grow up, they reach adulthood in, I think, eight months, almost, uh, sexual maturity, rather. This is uh, one of my favorites. I worked on an experiment where I was testing to see their response to flood threats. So they are a arboreal species from Trinidad, um, and they are very quick. Um, this is... For the flood response, I hooked up, I built a little gadget that I hooked up to the sink, and I could fill a tube with water, um, and it would push the tarantulas up a fake tree. But as you can see, I have tape all along the wall here, because two of them ran out of the tube and managed to get onto the sink, run up, and then hide behind our electrical paneling. Um, and I lost. spent... Yeah, so I lost one. And I spent about four hours looking for it um, and just gave up because I, it was somewhere along the wall somewhere and I couldn't find it. And then two days later, I met with the person who also works with those tarantulas and I was apologizing to him because he's using them in, in, in one of his experiments and I felt very bad. And then he goes, well, is that it? And it was walking across our table right here. <laughs> um, and Okay. I don't think me or him have moved faster in our lives to try and grab it. Um, but yeah, and then we don't only have tarantulas, we also have scorpions. So we did an experiment with um, inherited behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was some interesting results from that. I, I don't remember exactly, but I remember uh, some of the juveniles or some of the offspring showed similarities to some of their parents. Um, we had one male and then three females. Um, but because of that, we have many scorpions. This is a little guy. Um, and he's just about the size of my, the front of my finger. Mm -hmm. um, but that's in our uh, nursery. So we keep all of our baby tarantulas in all of these little containers. Um, here's all of our scorpions. So each one of these has a scorpion in them. Let's see, right there. Um, and I think we have about 50 of those. Um, and then we have a couple lab pets. Uh, the one that a lot of people like is our brown, brown recluse, um, just because they get a bad rap. So it's very tiny. It's about, let's see, it's kind of hard to see it. Let's see. Where is it? There it is. So it just sits there all day, doesn't do much. Um, I have videos of crickets walking over the top of it and it not reacting at all um, and it just trying to stay hidden. <laughs> we have our final uh, lab pet is our biggest tarantula we have. So she is about the size of my hand. I can't mm -hmm. really get in there. Um, she is, I believe, a Brazilian black tarantula. 
Um, the thing with her is she's nice. She barely ever strikes at us, but she will always throw hairs. So tarantulas have specialized hairs on their abdomens um, or on their backs that they can rub and throw into the air. They're called urticating hairs, and they will get in your nose and in your eyes, and it's like the worst allergy attack you've ever had. Mm -hmm. So that's why, actually, we have a piece of plexiglass over the most of her container, because when we throw in crickets or uh, fill her water dish, mm -hmm. um, she will inevitably start throwing hairs at us, uh, and the plexiglass oh, helps keep it quite in aggressive. There. Yes, yeah, and, and so that's the thing is she's she's aggressive, but then if you put your hand in there, she'll run away from it, or she'll you know walk up to it but never strike or anything like that. Um, we used to have, uh, and this is the last thing I'll show off the top of my head. We used to have a tarantula, um, and we don't we no longer had it. I believe we had it for um, uh, one student had it for I believe fifteen years. Um, we have its exoskeleton, though, from when it molts. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, it was quite big. Um, and it got a little bit bigger than this before it passed away. Um, and I believe its name was Bertha. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'd have to check on that one. But yeah, so she was a sweetheart from what I've heard. All of our tarantulas, no matter how defensive or aggressive they are, are always just trying to, you know, protect themselves. They're not really sure what's going on. Um, the problem we have with the lab is that it's not like a natural environment where they would constantly be being exposed to different vibrations and things like that. So every time we open the lid, it's their whole world is shaking. Yeah, so it's understandable that they're a little worried. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all of our species. I work with the orange baboon, and the arboreal, the uh, P or Minii, I believe is the Latin name, the Chevron Trinidad species. Um, but yeah, that's that's my lab. So we've got plenty of things in here to look at. <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> in that case, I can show around our lab. So um, we have around um, 1,000 cups with uh, spider spiderlings. And in each cup, we put uh, three to four spiderlings, and usually one of them makes it to adulthood. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, thousands of spiders in the lab right now. So this is how we keep our spiderlings. And um, here is, um, this is how we keep our adults that we're going to use for mating experiments. So they get to be in this, uh, we, I call it the penthouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they, they can uh, make a nice web here. Mm -hmm. I showed it before. It's like this one. Wow. But those that we're not using for experiments, um, they live in upside down cups. But I can still uh, walk you around the lab. So behind me are those um, spiderlings. And then here are the frames where we put the adult spiders. And here are more spiderlings, all of that. Here are some eggs. Wow. And here we have some adults in uh, upside down cups. So hmm. that's a female. And we just like throw food here and we put uh, cotton here for water and air exchange. And uh, sometimes, well, yeah, it has tape inside so that they have something to hold on to for climbing. Mm. So yeah, so these are all the cups. <laughs> and uh, here, uh, it's on the other side. So I will show you this one. This is how we keep our spiderlings. So we put the eggs here and then mm -hmm. they hatch. And let me find the best light. Maybe here, there. Uh -huh. And you can see the oh, little yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And then we divide this into um, our cups. And then we uh, rear them to adulthood. Here is a juvenile. Aww. And uh, here's a, a bigger one. 
probably close to sub-adulthood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, more and more and more <laughs> and more and more. Wow. And then here we have some black widows. So we are also growing all of these black widows. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah, incredible. Because yeah, we're, we're doing some experiments with developmental plasticity and also with um, inheritance of size. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe also we will do some uh, inheritance of behavior. Mm -hmm. We will see. And here's uh, the other lab. I hope I don't lose signal. Yeah. And here we have more black widows. Mm -hmm. And wow. there we have the... Um, Fishing spiders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're called Dolomedes fimbriatus. Oh, and we actually have a tarantula, but we don't have her here. And if I go find her, I'm going to lose the connection. But I okay. can show you one of her molds. Oh. Ooh. Yeah, she's a Brazilian salmon pink bird eater or something mm -hmm. like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's yeah. They get real big. They're a fun one. Yeah, and um, come back to the original lab. Mm -hmm. And then the, we feed the small spiders using fruit flies. So we grow our own fruit flies to feed the small spiders. Mm -hmm. And we um, actually um, suck the fruit flies with a footer. Um, uh -huh. A lot of arachnologists and, and entomologists are familiar with this. So... You basically just suck up the insect and then you throw it wherever you need it. Mm -hmm. And we also use um, flies and mealworms uh, to feed all the spiders, the big ones. So yeah, I've, questions. I'm seeing, yeah, so I'm seeing a couple of questions. Um, people are really interested in the cotton ball. So how does that help with the air? So is it just cut out of the cup and then you stuff a cotton ball in it? Yeah, that, that's, that's it. Oh, okay. um, there's not a lot of science in it. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to find an empty one. Yeah, I, it's drying the lab right now. Okay, so, so we just uh, make a hole in the plastic. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. okay. So it's just a hole, and then we, we put um, the cotton there, and then we spray water on top of the cotton, so then they, they get some humidity and they can drink water from it. Okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Some people were asking uh, about why some of the spiders, why we can keep them in such small containers. Um, I know for our tarantulas, uh, they a lot of them are terrestrial tarantulas, but we just put little hides or they'll dig burrows in there and then they'll just sit and wait for their food. Uh, I think we feed them every couple of weeks. Um, the, our, our, at least our tarantulas, I don't want to speak for your spiders, they have such a low metabolic rate that they can sit and wait for, they could sit and wait for months without food and be fine as long as they have enough water. We don't do that. We feed them at least twice a month um but for your for your uh orb weavers are they fine just sitting in the cups um so far <laughs> yeah right <laughs> i mean um the problem is uh space right. but usually um if we don't have thousands of spiders we try to uh, make them a nice um mm -hmm. environment like this one i don't know if you can see it i, I have to like oh wow yeah, so see, we, we find some branches and, and leaves so that they can be in a nice place. Mm -hmm. But uh, so far, they grow nicely in the cups. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're also sit and wait predators. So they just sit there and just wait for you to throw food to them. And mm -hmm. um, they so far, they're doing well. And if I transfer them to a frame, they will make their webs there and mm -hmm. eat normally. Yeah. yeah, the the way I, I'll explain it with our tarantulas is um, tarantula burrows in the wild will be in single coconuts uh, for some of the more tropical species. They'll find little tiny logs, they'll find big logs, they'll they'll just take whatever place they can get. So we, we scale up their enclosures with their size. Um, obviously, we're not going to keep them too cramped. Yeah. Um, but as far as like most ant or 
unlike most animals, they, they tend to be fine just sitting in a, an appropriate size container as long as they can build their web and, you know, feel safe in it. Um, let's see. Someone asked if the tarantula, uh, uh, the tarantula bird-eating spider really eats birds. Sometimes uh, they, I know they're opportunistic hunters. If a weak, small bird that it can grab walks by, I'm sure it would try to grab it. Um, but for the most part, they'll eat smaller amphibians and other insects. Um, let's see. Do you, have you ever been, oh, this is a fun one. Uh, have you ever been bit or bitten by any of your spiders? Me, no. Okay. I haven't either. So we haven't had anyone bitten in our lab and we're constantly working with them. So I think that kind of goes to show how timid the spiders tend to be with bites. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I have, um, I always uh, explain this example. Um, so you see this really big spider here. Mm -hmm. I hope you can see her. Yeah. Yeah. Fenestrata. So we brought a lot of them. Well, actually, from another species to the lab because we were trying to to have a population, and they they didn't want to make nice webs, so we had to hand feed them with mealworms, <laughs> and we were holding the mealworms, and the mealworms were like going in in circles and like literally slapping them in the face, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't bite them. Mm -hmm. So it took several attempts, sometimes five minutes, trying to, you know, <laughs> feed the spider. Right. Well. Yeah, and they just wouldn't attack. They, they just don't. Yeah, like, I think you have to kind of squeeze them in order for them to to really bite you. Mm -hmm. the, like I mentioned earlier, we have a brown recluse, and it's the most boring spider we have here. It will just it sits in the same spot all day, all night. It doesn't move. And it, in the States, they're seen as kind of a scary monster spider. Um, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not their venom is actually as bad as they say they are, but I'm not an expert on that. Um, but I mean, I, like I mentioned, I was feeding it one day and I watched the cricket walk over it and stand on it for a second and then walk off and the brown recluse did nothing. And then a few minutes later, the brown recluse got up and kind of walked and repositioned itself. So it wasn't dead or sleeping or anything. It just really didn't want to bite anything at that moment. Um, it's from my experience, experience, it's very hard to get bit by a spider unless you're intentionally grabbing it and annoying yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Someone asked about uh, non-native tarantulas and spiders escaping and if there's any ecological issue. Uh, from our point of view here, uh, we're in Michigan and we work with almost exclusively tarantulas uh, that are found in subtropics and tropical regions. So any tarantula, if it were to escape, um, it would stay in the building more likely. And if it got out into the, our parking lot or something, it would either quickly be eaten or die because of the cold, or um, if it were summer, probably just get run over. Uh, I, there's their chance of survival in an area they're not naturally prone to exist is very small, so. Yeah, it's the same here. Um, these mm -hmm. spiders are tropical and subtropical, and the ones from Croatia um, could potentially move um, move north to Slovenia mm -hmm. if the weather continues to warm up. But right now, the um, the winters here are too harsh for them, so mm -hmm. they would not make it in the wild. Uh, let's see. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, let's see. Sorry, I was reading out loud. Mm -hmm. Thanks for in, uh, one of the classrooms is leaving and they were just saying they have to go to lunch, but uh, they thanked us for letting us see, letting them see their lab. So thank you for tuning in. We have, uh, let's see, let's look for some other questions. What is your favorite part of working with the spiders? That's a good, that's a fun. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> um, I think in my case, it's uh, learning about all of their behaviors. Mm -hmm. So um, I think spiders have the coolest 
and like the most uh, uh, diverse um, sexual behaviors, like mm -hmm. weird sexual behaviors. <laughs> and I think I really <laughs> like learning about that. And um, they're just really nice to work with, and they're very cute. Yeah. I know a lot of people disagree, but uh, they're actually quite nice. I uh, I completely agree. I think they're adorable. They're uh, <laughs> I I tell a lot when I I do one on ones with classrooms or just talking to people outside when they find out I work with uh, spiders and tarantulas. I tell people I'm terrified of dogs. I have I'm. I'm scared of dogs. If uh, I'm walking down the street with my significant other, when we're walking, they will block for me if there's a dog walking towards us. So mm. I get why people are afraid of dog or afraid of spiders because I'm afraid of dogs and I see dogs every day. Just like people who are afraid of spiders probably are near spiders every day. Um, but it's the same thing where you know you just treat the animal with respect and they'll probably leave you alone. You know. Um, and once you start developing that respect, um, I feel like you start seeing all the little traits that make them adorable. Like, for example, the fact that baby spiders are called spiderlings. Um, that's yeah. just a cute name, you know? Mm -hmm. So You know, that, that's something that we haven't um, talked about is about their reproduction and about how males have their reproductive organs on, in, the, in front of their faces, actually. So they mm -hmm. have these appendages that are called pedipalps and they're like right in front of their faces and they're quite um, like just big swollen structures and they look quite cute also and yeah. maybe I have a male here I, I don't know if you can see it but I'll try to put it like this it's so tiny it's just <laughs> tiny yeah so this is one of the males for my big spider yeah Wow. Uh, yeah, sorry that so, you cannot see his cute face, but he has like this, like, they look like boxing gloves, mm -hmm. so like these. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so with, with yours, do you have like a rough, like, size difference? Like, is it like 10 times bigger between the female and the male? Do you, just off the top of your head? Or? Uh, the size difference? Yeah. Um, they can be... Um, yeah, I don't know in what kind of numbers to explain it, but okay, um, for example, the largest females that we've had are uh, from from my species that, that I work with are two grams. So that's they weigh around two grams, and the smaller the smallest males it can be um, as small as two milligrams. So there you okay. go. There's wow. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then uh, there's uh, actually a big um, size variation among males. And my biggest males have been uh, 16 milligrams. Mm. So that's like eight times heavier than the smallest one. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what all your research is on, right? Is, why yes. is that? I, I, yeah, I do test some um, environmental and sexual selection pressures on male size. Mm -hmm. And I haven't found anything conclusive that like there's no advantage for smaller male size so far in mm. my own experiments so i just keep getting negative results it's like no yeah. still large males are better at this so i don't know why <laughs> and we still have such tiny tiny males uh -huh. but yeah we'll keep uh -huh. trying to figure it out oh uh speaking about sexual size dimorphism i just wanted to say so this is the the size difference between males and mm -hmm. females i just wanted to say that it actually evolved um in different taxa, in different, um, so it evolved convergently. So okay. um, it wasn't like there's a group of spiders and that had um, sexual size, their morphism, and then all radiate from there. But um, I have a little bit of a phylogeny here. So the tree of life, this is just a little bit, <laughs> tiny bit of the tree of life of spiders and um, if you see the blue arrows, those are separate families that had evolved um, sexual size dimorphisms. So here are the black, wait. yeah, the black widows are here and aranas are here and then um, nephilites are here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they're not really like related, like didn't. Interesting. Yeah. We, uh, let's see. <laughs>
or some other questions people are asking. Mm -hmm. um, what, so you have how many different species roughly? You said like three or four in your lab? Uh, what was it? One, two, three. We actually work with three, okay. but uh, we have a pet. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, which, which species are, do you work with all three? No, um, okay. I work with Nephilingis cruentata, which okay. is the male right. I was showing you. Right. And these, uh, all of these are Nephilingis cruentata, all of these in the lab. Oh, that reminds, so where do you, this is kind of a leading silly question, but where do you get all your enclosures? Do you have someone that builds them for you or? Uh, yeah, we had to order them. Yeah, so okay. we ordered them back in 2015. All right, we uh, let me do something real quick. Um, in our lab, we have some specialized containers, um, but because we don't have to worry, unlike you with the like building up, we just get to use Tupperware containers. So yeah. I think most labs have an absurd amount of kitchenware that isn't used at all for kitchens. Um, yeah, um... it, it's what you got to keep them in. You have the same. <laughs> We're full of these. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes it's just easier to go to a, a grocery store and get a bunch of Tupperware rather than. Yeah, you know, that's exactly what you built. do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah. That's exactly how we have our black widows. Maybe I can um, mm -hmm. extend this. Hold on. I, I just need my cable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here. We have the, I actually put it upside down now, but usually it's just like um, the spider is inside this Tupperware and then we just cover it with a normal lid and we made holes so that they can mm -hmm. breathe. So. Um, let's see. What are some other some good questions? Um, why did you decide to work with spiders? Do you want to say? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, the reason I started working with spiders is I've always been interested in bugs and things crawling around on the dirt and ground and stuff. Um, I was always that kid that was collecting like cicada shells off of trees during recess when I was a little kid. Um, but then when I got to school or when I got to my university for my undergrad, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I thought about going into biology, but I hadn't decided yet. And then I found out that just by sheer luck, my university had a arachnids lab that I could potentially work in. So that made my decision for me. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, we have plenty of other labs. We have a, actually, we're right next door to a bat lab. Um, we have amphibians. Uh, my one of my good friends works with birds upstairs, so our university has plenty of research labs. But the spider lab was calling to me, um, so I I asked uh, the research professor if she would take me on, um, and I talked with her and then another research professor who uh, from Mexico who was visiting, and I worked with him uh, all last year um, on tarantulas, and it was just you know one of those things where everything worked out very nicely. Um, I'm not sure what I would be doing if I didn't have the arachnids lab. So I just like them, they're fun. Yeah, same. Uh, in my case, it was by chance. And mm -hmm. um, actually for my master's degree, I worked with dolphins. So like the most <laughs> charismatic animals in biology. <laughs> so I had the wow. chance to do um, a master's degree with dolphins, and mm -hmm. but I was always interested in behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, a friend of mine told me uh, that there was an opportunity to study with spiders in Slovenia. And I was mm -hmm. like, no, I'm not going to work with spiders. Because this friend of mine was constantly te teasing me about how much easier it is to work with arthropods and spiders. <laughs> and, and I said that I wasn't interested. And then uh, he still sent me the call and I read it and it, it was related to behavior. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I was applying to several PhDs and I got this one. Mm -hmm. And now now that friend that was teasing me is now my husband. <laughs> oh, wow. So that was like a side story. There's a side story to it. But we were back then we were friends. And then uh -huh. 
you know, that's a really good up. story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, spiders are really cool and they have really cool behaviors. So it was mm -hmm. really easy to fall into it, mm -hmm. and they're much easier than uh, dolphins to research. <laughs> exactly, you can't have fifty to a hundred dolphins in Tupperware containers in a room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So especially with like behavioral stuff, it makes it a lot easier because you get good numbers. Um, let's see. Uh, um, do you have anything else you want to point out or you want to say about your experience or anything as a scientist? That seems to be a common question is why are you a scientist and what makes being a scientist so fun? Or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Um, I think if you're a scientist and you're driven by curiosity, it's really fun. Then you get mm -hmm. to learn about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fun part. It's just learning about some exciting new thing every day and getting to collaborate with people and coming up with ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think... Yeah. And I, I also like... Then you can do some field work and some lab work, and there's always something new, and you can, um, you know, you're not sitting in a desk all the time, although sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes we are. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, like, I had months that I was just in the lab, and it was, it was a little bit intense. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually, there's some kind of balance between doing lab work and computer work, and yeah. it's, it's nice in general, yeah. I, I agree. I think I think you've hit everything I would have said. Um, it's just interesting. It's great because you get to work with so many people and interact with so many people um, from all over the world. You know, there's constantly conferences. If you're able to go and meet people doing research uh, in Europe, in Africa, in uh, South America, in Central America, uh, or in North America, um, and seeing what they're doing and how similar or how different their research or experiences um, is really valuable. And I think kind of the core of science is, you know, working together with everyone. Um, and I really like that. <laughs> it's really nice. Um, what else? I think, well, we, we've gone for 47 minutes. Have you guys, you see the questions that are coming up in the chat? Uh, my chat has, I've been trying to answer some of them. I'll read some of them off to you just to make sure we're getting. Yeah. Um, all right, so Alvin asks, what, I'm sorry, it's so loud here. Um, what evolutionary purpose did the spider's eight legs serve? Um, oh, I see them now. Okay, sorry, they were at the top. Okay, I'll, um, I'll, I'll uh, turn myself off. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, okay, here are some extra questions that I didn't notice. Yeah, so the question was, what evolutionary purpose do the spider's eight legs serve? Um, do the spider's the what? Eight legs serve? Like, why do they have eight legs instead of six or two or something? That's an interesting question. Hmm. I don't know. I guess uh, at some point in their evolutionary history back in... Who knows like way back in, in their evolutionary history, there was some segmentation and, you know, there's, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> they just no, meant it that way and then it just, I guess. Right. Yeah. I don't I, want I to think... say too many things that are incorrect. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm with you. Um, I know it's, so the question was uh, specifically about spiders, but, um, you know, it's scorpions. Yeah, I, I, I've been being careful. I'm, I'm trying not to say something incorrect. It's a really interesting question, but I think it's one of those questions that's just kind of so broad that, you know, unless you really study it, I don't think there's an exact purpose. Because I know some spiders will also, like, they're perfectly capable with walking with six legs if two of them mm -hmm. go missing or something like that. Um, there's been, I've, I've read a couple of things about uh, how spider movement changes based off of what legs they're missing. Um and it, it's all it's all interesting, but yeah, I, I'm not sure the exact origin of why they have eight legs. Um, so I kind of already asked you about what's your favorite part about being a scientist. Um, let's see. Question came in. Um, what 
are oh okay here's a good one the what are like the ecological benefits of spiders so many people see them in their house and squish them immediately um you know let's see so you go for it uh, you got it. <laughs> well they they are predators and mm -hmm. um Predators are really important in controlling uh, other populations. There, there's a lot of um, like top-bottom dynamics that mm -hmm. control the the dynamics in the community, and so and also spiders are very diverse. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of uh, different niches, mm -hmm. and yeah, basically, they're um, I would say their big ecological function is to be big predators mm -hmm. especially your orb weavers with their giant webs catching every flying insect that flies by I can imagine yeah, and sometimes <laughs> even bats bats <laughs> oh wow birds. at least in brazil there's been two cases of bats getting entangled in these webs wow yeah hmm. yeah with our so with our tarantulas they'll um silk a lot they'll spin webs and things like that but they tend to Oh, that one was getting a little jumpy. But their silk is really, it's not super sticky. Here, let's see. Mm -hmm. You see how well? It's not super sticky. It almost feels like um, like cotton. Oh, yeah. um, because it, tarantulas don't typically use their webbing to like capture prey, as opposed to yours, which I think that's the main point of the web. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, one of my my research uh, that I did with uh, Dr. Uh, Panau down in Mexico was seeing what function the silk plays with tarantulas because it's not that sticky. Things can't really get entangled in it. Um, and uh, we found some interesting results. I think we're, he's still working on the paper, um, so I have to be careful of what I can say, but it seems to be some sort of attraction mechanism. So rather than it actually serving a purpose, uh, other than the like tactile feel that tarantulas have where they can feel the vibrations in the web, there's some indication that the webbing also attracts prey because of the way it smells. Um, um, so. Maybe also uh, mates. Yes, oh yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to imagine if it's attracting prey. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Um, I think, let's see, I'm sorry, I keep ducking down because I'm scrolling through all the questions. That's fine. Um, what is, someone asked what dangers you face working with spiders every day, and I think we kind of touched on that. Um, I don't, there's nothing really dangerous other than like driving into work every day. I think that's the most dangerous <laughs> part about coming into the lab. Um, Same. But, you know, yeah, the the spiders are kept contained for most of it, um, and the ones that do get out are pretty harmless. Um, again, none of the spiders we keep in our lab will kill us, or really, we probably wouldn't even need to go to the hospital or anything. But if we did go to the hospital, it would just to keep our fluids up or something like that in case we had an allergic reaction. But it's not the venom that's really getting us it's um you know yeah. they're not deadly same here uh even the black widow is um actually not that dangerous here mm -hmm. it, just, it's, it just hurts a lot <laughs> yeah exactly that's it yeah the the bigger the so our bigger tarantulas the thing that hurts the most is either their hairs that they kick out because it just mm -hmm. you get it into your nose and your mouth and your eyes and it just it's like a bunch of little barbs um, that stick everywhere. And then uh, the bigger the tarantula, the bigger the thing. So, you know, it's the same thing where that's probably the worst part is the initial bite because it's just kind of surprising, but it's not, you know, it's not going to kill you or you know, make you convulse or anything like that. Uh, yeah. They're not as bad as movies have made them out to be. Um, what, so what are some... Uh, have you found any interesting preliminary results or anything from your research that you can talk about? Have you? 
Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, we uh, found some interesting things with the tarantula silk. Um, we saw a, a pretty clear attraction um, from the silk uh, when in regards to prey. Um, but my one of my personal projects, so the one that uh, after I finished up the silk one was the arbor the best way it was um, we have some data, uh, some papers on the way tarantulas uh, and spiders in general react to predators. Um, there's one paper uh, that found that uh, spiders tend to be missing their left legs more than their right, indicating that they're giving them up more. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to see um, if that was in response to predators, all these arboreal species that live in the tropics would have to move up trees depending on floods. Um, so some, you know, in some places in the rainforest, it can change 10 meters in a couple of days, the water level. So I would run spiders up a fake tree and slow, by slowly increasing the water. And then I would have them pick a side. So they'd either have to go left or right. Um, and with the tarantula species that we were working with, or I was working with, um, we found that they significantly went left. Uh, which we try, we tried our best to control lighting, sounds, vibrations, temperature, wind, everything. Um, but uh, yeah, um, close to eighty. No, I forget the percentage. Um, more than two thirds of them would go left when they were given the option, which is just weird. And <laughs> I have no idea. You know, it's it was just a fun uh, semester long trial um and i'm not sure really what it says maybe spiders are left-handed um <laughs> but it, it's just interesting uh so that that's my research it's pretty just yeah you know, i think of something at the beginning of the semester and then see how what happens <laughs> yeah so i have um, one interesting um one interesting uh, research we did and we actually published it um, when we went to South Africa in 2015 to collect um, this uh, Triconephila spider, so the giant or weavers, the, the one I showed you on this corner here. Mm -hmm. um, so we went to collect those. And when we were collecting them, um, my supervisor was, was with me and he started to notice that the males were from the wrong species. Oh, no. So, and then we, we started to like really look and collect uh, um, several samples and then I analyze the data and it turns out that the males were randomly um, distributed among uh, the webs regardless of their species. So apparently they were not, <laughs> they were not very good at recognizing their own females. <laughs> but then I, we also saw in the field um, these uh, interspecies sexual interactions Mm -hmm. So we saw um, two mating events between two, sp between two species. Mm -hmm. And we also saw um, males from one species. So the, so the male from the wrong species was chasing away the male of, like the proper male of the female. <laughs> so then there could be some implications in terms of um, some population dynamics and community dynamics. And huh. Yeah, so that was a really cool discovery. And yeah. I, actually, we, we brought them to the, to the lab, some of them. And I put males in, in this maze also to make a choice between their own female and, um, and the wrong female. And there was around a 30% of error, which is quite high. Yeah. So, huh. and, and I had a very uh, small sample size because they were not, um, I mean, not very small, but... Um, mm -hmm. They were not doing well in the lab, and I didn't mm -hmm. have so many left from the mm -hmm. from the trip. So I did whatever I could with the ones I, I had, and so the error could be even more. So the I don't know, mm -hmm. but at least in the in the field it was um um yeah um we kept finding the wrong males, and it was very prevalent that these males were yeah. just in the wrong females and and courting them and mating with them. Yeah, I actually have a. A photo of a male. I know it's really bad quality and it's uh, black and white, but that's a big mm -hmm. female. And then this really tiny thing here is a male. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. And he's he's from the wrong species. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating. <laughs> That's so weird. I haven't I've never heard of that. Wow. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think th this was the first recorded case in nature because they wow. there there've been some um staged um right. Yeah. Stage matings between species, but hmm. um yeah, that was in the field. Hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, so just um, while well, I'm looking for another uh, question, um, do how many spiderlings hatch out of an egg sac typically for you, for your orbit? Hundreds. <laughs> Hundreds? Okay. Yeah, I, I know you showed it earlier. Um, yeah. It, the, with the tarantulas, we see about the same. So we'll get less that we won't get many many little ones but we'll get about you know anywhere from 20 to 60 on a good on a good egg sack um and then with the tarantulas i i, I think uh the tarantula egg sacs feel very strange because it, it is like tearing apart a cotton ball um and then yeah, all of a sudden there's yeah. all these all these uh if you if anyone watching has the time i'd recommend looking up a uh, hatchling tarantulas just because they look like little jelly beans almost. Yeah, <laughs> with it's like little balls with legs. Like yeah, they're really <laughs> cute. Um, but then you know, there's hundreds or you know, a lot mm -hmm. of them in this little tiny sack. Uh, so yeah, um, let's see. So we've been going for about an hour, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any final questions? Anything you like that, Ed? I think this was like one of the wildest ones we've ever done. This is really, <laughs> <laughs> I've been like sitting here just like sweating watching you guys. This is really great. Um, I guess if you just want to have like any last advice you'd give to young people who might want to do what you do. And then after that, we can just wrap it up. Okay. You can go first, Kira. Um, so wait, that was advice for anybody who wants to be a scientist? Yeah, I believe so. Any young people looking to be scientists? Um, yeah, I think, um, it's great to have a balance between, um, being driven, like career driven and then, uh, being driven by curiosity. Mm -hmm. And of course you have to plan ahead and, and I mean, not plan ahead, but try to be strategic about uh, your chances and your opportunities and try to apply for everything that you qualify for. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I would say at least for myself. Um, if you're into science and if you're into a particular topic, that's going to help you a lot. If you have that passion for a particular topic, um, it's going to help you a lot to go into that direction. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I mean, in my case, uh, I have to be a little bit obsessed with something to be able to really engage with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that helps a lot. And uh, I, I would say, read all you can about things that fascinate you and don't be afraid to talk with professors. And, and usually scientists are very happy to talk about the research. So just <laughs> like, don't be scared and ask for anything you, you, mm -hmm. you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And um, also, um, um, I would say learn <laughs> programming if you can <laughs> yeah. and learn as early as you can because yeah I mean I'm, I'm from a generation that we didn't have these um, programming so I, I started using R when I was doing my master's mm -hmm. and um, yeah I was in my mid-20s so I was still <laughs> quite mm -hmm. young but then I forgot and then I had to learn again and it's um, quite uh, difficult sometimes mm -hmm. but it's very possible and uh, you shouldn't be afraid of it it's actually quite fun but if you have the the chance to learn it, learn it and be like, oh, I don't need that. You, you do. Even biologists need a lot of math. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it's it's complex math and it would be nice to have that background to secure a career in science. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. Um, I know just from going to the university I go to and uh, growing up and being in the area that I go to, I, I think it's important that everyone recognizes that anyone can be a scientist. Um, there's, I, you know, you, you, it helps a lot with 
math and things like that. But, you know, if, if you're really creative and you're really good at art or something and you don't think that you could get fit into the sciences, it's so creative. You, you every, Coming up, di designing the experiments, I uh, had to make several trips to go to Home Depot to figure out and jerry-rig a bunch of PVC piping to build some contraption. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if, if the sciences are, and I don't want to use... I'm going to use the term if they're too hard or something, but that's not the right way to say it. But, um, you know, there's art, the, there's science art. Every scientist, when they publish their paper, would love to have illustrations made for them, um, things like that. Um, you know, it, it's not just some hard field. You can be interested in behavior like I am and like you, you are. Um, there's community level stuff. There's molecular stuff there, there's so many fields uh in science in biology uh in in science in general um but even in each field in biology in chemistry there's so many more specializations that i think that you can really find that perfect thing for you um if you're not super into math um or if you, you struggle with math your lab partners and things like that will be able to help you and teach you and show you, point you in the right direction. Um, I think, you know, the, the biggest thing for me with science is that it's collaborative. You know, yeah. you, you don't just do it yourself. Um, That's true. Um, yeah. I actually struggled a lot with math mm -hmm. and I'm still not um, that good at it. Mm -hmm. But um, it's true, you can always ask somebody and it's, uh, mm -hmm. you, you never work alone. And I know people, I know scientists with uh, dyscalculia. Mm -hmm. So this is a developmental disorder where you have um, problems uh, with numbers and calculations. And they're still scientists because you yeah. can always, um, you, you can do all the creative work about how to set up an experiment, etc. And then you can have the help of a mathematician, statistician, and that, that definitely shouldn't limit you. And I know um, mm -hmm. scientists who are um, neurodiverse, uh, who have autism. I have ADHD, and mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. all, yeah, we managed, you know. So, yeah, yeah there are obstacles, yeah. of course, but if you're really, really into it, then, um, yeah, anybody can be a scientist. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have friends that were in their undergrad for, you know, well past four. Some of them are, took them eight years and they're, they're here now, you know, it's, it, it's different for everyone. Um, but yeah. if you can get there, it's great. Um, yeah, exactly. and, yeah. And there's resources to help and everyone, most scientists I've met have been wonderful people. Um, and we're all here to help each other. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, all right, Sarah, anything else? That was perfect. You guys were great. Okay. Well, um, so the next session, I think, is next week. Okay. Yeah, it's the 14th. Um, it's going to be on veterinary science. So we're going to have a vet in. Um, actually, my college roommate, Deirdre, she's a vet now. Um, so we'll talk to her uh, next week on Tuesday. Um, otherwise, I think you guys are good. Thanks so much for joining us. This is really amazing. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Ciao. This was fun. Bye-bye.